So hopefully everybody can see my screen right now. What I'll do is I'll turn on my camera just to wave and yep. say hello. I don't know if yep. you can see that. Can you see me, everybody? Just want to say hello from my uh, cluttered office. Uh, yeah, looks but, good. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I want to talk a little bit about uh, lithium isotopes and lithium isotope determination on a quad. And it's a little different than the way we normally uh, determine isotopes. And so uh, I want to bring this to everybody's attention that, that you know, th things are possible on quads these days that, that were a lot harder in the long run, a, a lot harder, you know, in previous years. So I had a question for everybody really before we begin. Uh, you found out a little bit about me, so I'd like to find out a little bit about you. It's it's a little bit more challenging. I can't see everybody. You guys don't get a chance to see me. So I'm going to start a poll. And the question is basically, what industry are you in? And so I want to hear from you, you know, what your background is. So as I talk, we can we can hopefully uh, generate some some questions and some ideas and things that we could talk about that might be that might be useful to you so if you wouldn't mind i think the poll popped up i hope the poll popped up um, i'm going to give you about a a minute or so just to kind of click in are you in uh, one of the following sectors environmental geology mining industrial or something else and i can see a whole bunch of you are already voting which is really cool um, there are some things that about the web that I, I, I'm really enjoying a whole lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just as this poll goes on, I want to I want to kind of go to my first slide here and I'm going to leave it in this kind of format. if Nobody minds because I find it easier if we need to go back and refer to a slide. It's there and I don't cover up my other screen here. So the first question obviously is why why lithium um and lithium being it's first of all it's the lightest of all the metals but there's a lot of uses for lithium um we have lithium batteries we have lithium in ceramics lithium in glass lithium in metallurgy lithium in pharmaceuticals lithium in polymers for air treatments and stuff like that but lithium is also really important in the geologic environment as it's the lightest element and it's a, a, a group 1A, it's an alkali metal. So it has some strange behavior. So it really does a whole lot in trying to determine what's going on, whether it be fluids in the mantle or uh, movement in the ecologic and the environmental uh, aspect. And, and so, I'm going to close out this poll in a minute. Everybody vote. Are we good? 93%. I yeah, like 92. 92. Yeah. I think we're close. Yeah, you got to pretty good. The poll. And I just want to bring your attention to this center slide. Let me let me try this. Let's see what happens. Oh, good. My other stuff is in the background, so I can still see what's going on here. Yay. So, give me a second. Let's use this guy. So now everybody sees that it's nice and bright. So what we're looking at here is the lithium isotopic uh, range for, these are all geologic. And I'm gonna talk a lot about geologic because I am geology. I know only, 9% of you are there, but the environmental guys look down here. We've got seawater, river water, lakes, rivers, brine, groundwater. Uh, so for the environmental guys, it's there. For the industrial guys, uh, you guys are going to have to tell me uh, what exists in batteries, what exists in, in you know, for the folks in, in, in pharma, what, what exists in, in medicine. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to present this is because I want to find out where lithium is and, and whether or not it makes a difference whether you're in the mass mass seven state but what we can see is that at least for a moon uh for most meteorites we have a very narrow range of lithium compositions for mid-ocean ridge basalts these are the, the the rocks that are underneath our ocean again a very narrow range when we deal with continental crust we have a fairly wide range of lithium isotopes 
where we're dealing with river waters and lakes, uh, we have a huge range. And it really all depends on what salts are in them and how lithium is separating six from seven. Seawater is actually really narrow. It's about 30 per mil uh, on the positive side. So it's, it's pretty heavy. <clears throat> And if you mix anything together, you can get a lithium isotope signature. Now, what's important here is note the scale. Okay, we're looking at 0, 5, 10, 15. So if we can measure a one per mil variation, we're doing pretty good. We can really tell, start to tell some of these things apart, except where the reservoirs are completely overlapping. But we're really looking for a one mil precision. So there's been some previous work on lithium, and I'm going to open up one more poll right away. And what I want to find out is, have you ever performed an isotope ratio analysis? And you know what what kinds of of uh, what kinds of isotopes are you familiar with? And so if you've done isotope analysis, there goes the poll. It's open. You can just like yes or no. Um, then you understand something about isotopes and isotopic analysis, and, and that helps me. Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll dive into a little bit more about it. Uh, so far, 1% voted, and it's, just, it's an astounding no. Um, but that's, we'll, we'll see where everybody gets. But isotope analysis, oh, we've got, it's going back and forth. It's bouncing. All right, so that's interesting. I, I love this. I've watched you guys respond. I know you're awake. I'm going to have to use this in one of my classes just to make sure that all my students are awake. Um, so most of you guys, it seems like, have not done anything with isotope analysis. Hopefully, you know a little bit about isotopes. But basically, the idea here is that we talk in terms of these DEL notations. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we talk about stable isotopes. We talk about radiogenic isotopes. Um, typically, these DEL notations, what they are is we take this, the, the ratio of one mass over the other and we compare it to a standard. That's really all this is. It's the comparison, and I'll have a, an equation up in a little bit, the comparison of the lithium six to seven ratio of the sample versus the standard. And so if we can measure that ratio precisely, we're in really good shape. I'm gonna close this poll here. We got most people have voted, so that's good. Um, and previous work on lithium has been on the machines that are really good at measuring more than one thing at a time. So we're looking at mass spectrometers like the thermal ionization mass spec or the secondary ionization mass spec. We have done some work on atomic emission, um, but the bulk of the work has been done on multi-collector. What happened to my laser pointer? There it goes. Most of the work has been, it's going back and forth. I apologize. Let's see if I can get you back. There we go, multi-collector. So most of this work has been done on multi-collector. And what multi-collector is really, really, really good at is simultaneous measurement because it has multiple collectors. So you can collect both masses at the same time. And that really gives you this, this incredibly fast and incredibly precise measurement uh, that's happening. So TIMS, the issue with TIMS is just thermal. And we want to think about the 6-7 ratio and mass 6 and mass 7 there's a huge mass difference between them. So when we're thinking about like hydrogen one and hydrogen deuterium, hydrogen two, uh, those are stable isotopes. Hydrogen is mass one, hydrogen uh, deuterium is mass two, that's 100% difference. Six to seven is about a 15% difference. When we're thinking about things like uranium 238 to 235, it's a really, really small mass difference. So the larger the mass difference, the more these two uh, isotopes will move relative to each other. And because TIMS gives a lot of heat, you would think that they would move together, but in fact, it actually fractionates them. The ratio can be precise, though. There's a lot of work that's been done on TIMS, and, and some of it's quite good. 
SIMS, on the other hand, and AAS, the precision is not as good. It's less than one per mil. And we'll remember, we're trying to hit that one per mil. That's our ideal if we can get it. Uh, one per mil is going to tell us a whole lot. And uh, SIMS is the secondary ion mass spec, is, sends out an ion beam. So it's really good for measuring things like the lithium isotope ratio in individual minerals because those are quite tiny. And so the ion beam is very tiny. So we can go in and we could zap single crystals and we can get an isotopic measurement. But if we notice the precision on this is about two per mil. And so SIMS has its advantages, but it also has its disadvantages. With multi-collector, we can get that simultaneous measurement. And by and, by and large, this is how most of the studies have been done for not only lithium, but other uh, radiogenic isotopes such as strontium neodymium uh, and uranium lead. Uh, so many of those have been done on multi-collectors because again, measures everything at the same time. Precision is quite good, 0.2 to 0.6 per mil. But the issue with multi-collectors is they're not super sensitive. And so we need a little bit larger of a sample. So this is 40 to 100 nanograms per gram or 40 to 100 ppm of lithium, <clears throat> excuse me, in the sample in order to be measured. <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, got to get, get a little bit of water. So overall, multi-collector analysis gives you this, this very, very uh, narrow range, very tight uh, two sigma variation of 0.1 to 0.8 per mil for a single analysis on a single day. And long-term stability can be between one and 2.7 per mil. In other words, I've got the same rock, I'm analyzing it over and over and over and over and over again over the course of weeks, months, years. And so that's really quite good. And that is very close long-term to our one per mil, and certainly for a day, we're well within it, which is where we wanna be. So why should we change? And, and why use a quad? What are the advantages? And the advantages of using the multi-collector and the TIMS is they were highly precise and they're simultaneous. With the disadvantages, they're less expensive. They're highly temperamental machines, multi-collectors and SIMS, have a, a if you've if you've ever worked on them they have a lot of issues and they're much more expensive so one more poll one more poll do you have experience with any of these guys and so i'm going to launch the poll right here <coughs> excuse me having a little little trouble with my allergies this morning but that's that's a standard thing So we got a few people, and most of you guys are optical. <clears throat> Looks like a fair bunch of you have worked on ICPs. Yeah, a few people with Tim's and Sims. <clears throat> and most everybody with ICPMS and and probably ICP OES if I'm gathering correctly, or at least AES. So those people who have worked on multi-collectors, TIMS and SIMS, you guys know what I'm talking about. The machine is down more than it's up. And that's part of the, part of the issue which we have with those machines. They're, they're, they're highly temperamental. <clears throat> Quads, on the other hand, and we're running a Nexian 2000P. Um, they're extremely sensitive. I'm going to close out this poll. Thank you. Thank you for being on top of that. <clears throat> so they're extremely sensitive. Their, their sensitivity is, is absolutely outstanding. It is so much better than a multi-collector sensitivity. And it's easy, really easy to resolve one PPB or one nanogram per gram of lithium. Uh, or sorry, one picogram. No, wait, nanogram, microgram, nanogram. PPB, nanogram, wow, changing back and forth. Geologists, by the way, use PPB. It's just easier for us where we we're sometimes, you know, we get into the chemistry world and we've got to do all these conversions and it's just, uh, yeah. 
I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, we very easy. We in fact we tune the instrument to one PPB. And so getting sub PPB is possible on one of these guys. Good luck trying to get that on a multi collector. Even Sims or Tims, it's very hard to get down to these low levels. The other thing that are great about the Nexians is that they are one third the cost of multi collectors. So if you think about a multi collector, they'll range into the mid to upper hundreds of thousands of dollars. Last time I worked on a Sims, it was about $2.5 million. So it's really hard to get grants for these guys. They're not readily available because of the cost of the, the quad ICPs. Many labs can actually afford them. Many labs can have them. And I write here in a catches fire, far less than a Sims does. If you've never worked on a Sims, I went into Carnegie Institute of Washington and their motherboard had melted down and they were like, oh yeah, don't worry, we got another one on hand just for those kind of occasions. I don't have to worry about that on my quad. This is a very stable, very solid instrument that allows lithium isotopic measurements to become routine, which is exactly what we want. <clears throat> so some previous work, uh, lithium isotopes in 1987, uh, we're done on a quad. Uh, these were for urine. And the sample analysis times were a whopping seven minutes or more. 1996, um, the precision, we brought it down a little bit. The samples had less than 300 ppm lithium. That's a lot of lithium. So certainly the sensitivity wasn't there. But what they discovered is that we need to do some sort of digestion followed by a lithium separation. And what they found is that the matrix matching doesn't work. And I wrote down here that the lithium separation is necessary. Uh, there's an issue with the matrix with, with sodium. So we need to get rid of that. There was some work in the 2000s. They brought the sample size way down with a precision of less than 1.5 per mil, long-term precision about two per mil. Uh, Misra and Froelich, they wound up using cool plasmas. For those of you who've done this before, a lot of times for the alkali metals, we think about cool plasmas, um, but they used long dwell times, uh, but their precision was quite good and their samples had very, very, very little lithium in them. So they can go really, really low. And that's the advantage of the quad. Uh, more recently, uh, Brandt et al. in 2012, they did 100 mils a minute sample uptake, a very low sample uptake, but again, they had these longer dwell times. And so we've tried a few things. We didn't bother trying this 600 watt uh, because if you're doing your separation, you should have pretty much so nothing else there. So you don't really need to worry about the cooler plasma, you actually want to ionize everything uh, because hopefully everything that's there is just your lithium. <clears throat> really important, we need some sort of digestion. We did our rock digestion. We did them in PFTE or the Teflon uh, jars and we weighed out very precisely. We digested the sample for rocks in a mixture of hydrofluoric and nitric nasty stuff. If you don't need to use it in your lab, please don't. Uh, for rocks, it's the only thing that breaks those silicon bonds. Uh, and we repeat this until we get a nice clear solution so we know we've killed everything. And then we bring the sample up in a six milliliters of one molar nitric and three milliliters of methanol. And so this is the beginning of our separation. And molarities here matter. They matter very much. So be careful and make sure that your molarities are good. There's a few references for that. If you guys need them, they're down here. I'm happy to share them. Then we send them through a column. This is our BioRad resin. Uh, and we drop it through the column and we flush it. Then we add uh, seven molar nitric, backwash, flush, rinse, rinse, flush. We do a whole lot of different things. And we condition the columns, make sure that we get everything out, everything through. And this whole process, well, there's a lot of steps to it. And each one, the molarity, the pH, all of that matters, the amount of methanol. 
it all matters. And you'll see a couple of places where things kind of went a little funny. And I think it has more to do with these column procedures and making sure that everything's perfect. So it'll really test your bench chemistry to do the separations for lithium. Finally, what we wind up doing is we wash 40 milliliters through our column and we collect it. And then we collect our sample from 41 to 170 milliliters. We dry it down and then pick it up to the appropriate volume. Again, for the Nexian, we need to dilute to 10 parts per billion or less. So we don't need much lithium. When we're dealing with multi-collectors, we need a much higher concentration, 30 to 100 ppb. So if you're starting with very little to begin with, ICPMS is the way to go because that way you don't need very much in your sample to end off with. So the instrument itself, what do we do? Our operating conditions, we kept our RF at 1600 watts. I tried lowering it, didn't do a thing. Lithium is you know, still being ionized. And again, if we're separating everything out, we don't really need to lower it down because the idea of lowering it down was to deal with matrix. You're, you're getting on a lower, lower RF, you're getting the easily ionized elements, but you're not getting the other ones. The other ones are neutral. If you got rid of all of them, then you know by all means crank the RF. Our neb gas, we optimize the neb gas uh, based off of a lithium solution, ox gas, plasma gas. Uh, those were all taken care of by the instrument and the tuning. Uh, the dwell time is something we played with though, and we varied the dwell time from five to fifty milliseconds for mass seven, and we varied the dwell time from ten to hundred milliseconds for mass six. A um, little longer for mass six than for mass seven. And remember folks before we're doing uh, somewhere around 250 to 300 milliseconds for mass six and somewhere between 10 and 50 for mass seven. And in the early days, even longer than that. What we wanna do is kind of trick the machine to act like a multi-collector. We want it to read these things as simultaneously as possible. So our optimal dwell times, we kept them short, five to 10 milliseconds. So it's bouncing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth between six and seven. And so that was, that was really important to try and trick it into, into being more like a multi-collector. Again, we're only bouncing back and forth from mass six to mass seven. We're not going through the whole range. So the electronic hysteresis is probably a little lower, probably something that we have to worry about less. But what we did do is we did 75 sweeps per reading. So we repeated this back and forth 75 times to give us a reading. And then we repeated that for 150 replicates. Overkill, and I'll show you why, but in the long run, it gave us that data that allowed us to see how things are changing over time. <clears throat> Hang on, sorry. There it goes. Oh, come on. There we go. So we determined, of course, standards. And we corrected everything. Why is my mouse now frozen? Oh, boy. There we go. Too many screens, too many windows. There we go. Uh, so we determined everything to this LSFAC. LSFAC is a lithium carbonate and it has an isotopic value, del lithium of zero. Boy, we're geologists. I told you, you know, math and conversions, not our thing. So wherever possible, we set everything to zero or to one. So the standard LSFAC definitely set to zero, plus or minus about 0 0.03 per mil. Okay, but we'll see how that's analyzed. So you'll get an idea of, you know, how much you, you buy the 0 0.03. And here's that equation that I was talking about, the del lithium seven is the ratio of lithium seven to six for the sample divided by this LSFEC standard, minus one times a thousand. And it's very similar to the equation that we normally see for del notation for our stable isotopes. <clears throat> so we compare it to BHVO, these are known values. Uh, BHVO is a basalt from the Hawaiian Volcanic Observatory. It is a lava from Hawaii, 
very simply put. And they collected a whole big pile of it and analyzed it. And we could see that our lithium values here, we have 4.5 to 5 ppm of lithium in this rock based off of a whopping two analyses. If we consider all the analyses that have ever been done, it's 1.8 to 7.94. Guess what? That's a much larger range. We have a lithium isotopic value between 3.7 and 5.7 based off of 51 analyses. BIR, basalt from the Icelandic rift. Somebody went to Iceland, not recently, although if you guys wanna go see lava for real, go to Iceland now, uh, but I'm not sure they'll let us in anymore. But nonetheless, these are from the basalts from the Icelandic rift, rocks, volcanic rocks. Again, whopping six analyses. We look at all the analyses, the ridge grows bigger and our isotopic value is based off of five, five whole analyses. AGV, uh, this is an andesite from Guano Valley made by the United States Geologic Survey. They collected it. Uh, go look up Guano Valley. This is a real place. Um, again, very, very, uh, uh, that should be N equals 14. Not too many analyses, big wide range of stuff. <clears throat> this is a glass mountain rhyolite. N equals one, a whopping one analysis. So what's going on here? We don't have numbers in seawater, of course, and that's our, that's our seawater. So people haven't done this. This is new. And this is all the more reason why we need more and more and more analyses. So we want to continue this work. And if we can make it readily available by using quad as opposed to multi-collectors, which are hard to find, now we can make this readily available. So here are our results, and here's that initial result. And what we can see is this is the lithium seven versus lithium six. And for the first 30 seconds or so, we get this ingrowth, this build in, and then everything relatively stable thereafter. This represents this entire range in seven, all by the way, mass seven is always in orange, mass six is always in blue. And we're talking about roughly a 5% variation with a couple of outliers here and there. So every now and then you get something else. But for the most part, it's about a 5% variation. Even when we're looking at the beginning, we see mass six and mass seven rising together. And that's important. And I'll, I'll show you why in a second. So for the first 30 seconds, we have this built in and then stability is reached. And it stays quite stable for both masses as long as you're counting. So it's not like it trailed off out at 175 seconds. <clears throat> this is why that in growth is important. This is for LSFEP. And what we're dealing with is six versus seven in exactly the same way. Notice the rise in the first 25 seconds. Six doesn't really rise, but seven does. So what does that mean? It means that six, uh, sorry, seven <clears throat> is not being taken up as fast as six and it's not entering and stabilizing in the plasma as fast as six, which suggests that there is a kinetic fractionation. We believe it's probably in the tubing. Um, so what we're looking at is that six being lighter moves faster through the tubing then does the seven even if it's as it's being pulled into the mass spec it's going to move a little faster but by then we're dealing with the mass back and the vacuum in there so it's going to pull both of these guys uh almost simultaneously so that's why we think it's in the tubing and so your tubing is important how much tubing you have is important <clears throat> but again once we reach stability we reach stability so how do we deal with that Good Lord, my mouse froze again. Where am I? There we go. Oh, now I got an arrow and a mouse. <laughs> so if we look at that uptake, that uptake here, we have this one actually where this was one of our experiments where we started the machine with really no delay time whatsoever. We put it in, we let the sample, we, we, we hit go and we started to get counts as soon as the sample came up. And this is when our sample started to give us counts. And we could see that it was roughly almost 75 seconds worth of uptake. 
But that uptake, if we look at the ratio of seven over six, even for this one over here, and this one at 50 seconds over the other one at 50 seconds, and this off one nearly in 150 seconds, and this one also something weird happened. You know, I, I used to have a, a service engineer who said, oh, you swallowed a nugget, or we didn't swallow a nugget. But we've we've all had those times where, you know, for some reason intensity just dropped and then it comes back or a sample didn't work. Well, this is one point where it didn't work, but but it did. Because when we look at the ratios, we're not looking at the overall intensities. We're looking at the intensity of six versus the intensity of seven or seven over six. And what we find is that this ratio is conserved the entire way, 17.21 plus or minus a two sigma standard deviation of 0.7. If we lop off everything at 75 seconds and just consider the back half of this, we can see that the ratios, these indeed go flat. Our slopes are quite low compared to our scales. And our 7-6 ratios remain 17.20 versus 17.21, and a 2 sigma of 0.68 versus a 2 sigma of 0 0.70. So the ratio was conserved in this case. To be sure, in this case, it's probably not conserved quite as well, but to be sure, come on, oops, spinning wheel of death, there it goes. To be sure, I would, I would advocate for lopping off that, that in-growth period, but you can use the whole thing. It really wasn't very different. <clears throat> so the simplest way to deal with the in-growth is to take a time intensity and cut off the first 25 to 50 seconds. Makes for a little bit longer of an analysis, but it makes for a cleaner analysis. Second way is obviously you could set your delay time and let your instrument, you know, you could walk away from it because you have a longer delay time. And then your instrument, you know, will, will deal with that in growth by not counting until it's over. Again, makes for a longer analysis. Sorry, that's just kind of, you know, this is, this is isotope ratio here. We, we need a little bit more time. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, the 175 seconds is probably more than what we need. So if we look, I've lopped off this analysis down only 60 seconds of sample collection, and it's quite stable over those 60 seconds. So 60 seconds should be more than sufficient. <clears throat> and of course, I want to reduce my dwell times to be as short as possible. Five seconds on mass seven and 10 seconds on mass six. Excuse me. Longer dwell times don't seem to make any difference. So I'm not going to bother. The other thing I don't want to do is increase my pump speed. I don't want to change my pump speed at all. And in fact, if we are getting fractionation in the tubing, it's going to change if we change pump speed. So if we pull in fast, like I normally do in an analysis, I'll, I'll have an uptake at 30 RPM. And then I'll slow it down for the for the initial um, for the initial read time, and then when I'm collecting, I stay at that same speed. I would recommend not doing that because if it's a kinetic thing, then that's going to change as soon as you slow down, and then you're going to need a, a 75 second or so read delay anyway until it stabilizes out. So leave your pump speed alone. <clears throat> so. Here we go. Here's our in run precision. So we saw the variation, and to you guys, it seemed like a whole lot of scatter, but here's our relative standard deviations on six and seven. And what we're looking at is RSDs in the 75 different acquisitions over, over the course. We're dealing with 2.2 RSDs, 2.4, 2.5. We get this bump up here we've got an rsd and remember this is a point that kind of went a little weird it's 7.3 and 7.5 clearly not necessarily where we want to be and we've got these down here 6.5 but for the most part everything is three percent or less rsds look at our ratios our ratios are conserved so even though we had rsds that were low within three percent 
our 7-6 ratio is 13.897. And even when we went to 7.3, 7.5, we have the exact same 7-6 to 6 ratio. So those hiccups, even though they are hiccups and we'd rather not have any, they don't necessarily mean you're gonna get bad results. And when we look at these over here, we're all within uh, a spitting distance of each other in terms of the seven, six ratio. So they're really, really, really close, even though our RSDs are not quite ideal. That 3% or less is really where we wanna be. <clears throat> the other thing that we gotta look at is the seven, six ratio over time. So early, middle, and late, these are ones that we did early in our experiments, hence the name early. Alex likes to keep it simple, my co-author Alex, and, and he says early. Uh, these were kind of mid, midway through, you know, messing around with this, and these were the ones that we did later on, so we call them early, middle, and late. Um, okay, that sounds great to me. But what we can see is that we have this stable signal, we have this little bit of ingrowth here, and our ratio is, you know, this number over that number. When we look sometime in the middle, our intensities dropped, but they dropped for both six and seven. So our ratio is conserved. When we look later on, our ratio is different. So if we're looking at the ratios, we're dealing with a ratio of 15 plus or minus 0.5 or 0.48 per mil, 13 plus or minus 0.49 per mil, and 17 plus or minus 0.57 per mil. Okay, those are very different numbers, right? But remember, the equation says sample over standard. So if our ratios, our intensities from our sample also change. So let's suppose we have 15 and our sample is 15 and we have 13 we then collect later on, but our sample is 13 and we have 17 for the LSFAC and later on our sample is 17, then seven over six sample over standard remains one the whole time. 15 over 15, 13 over 13, 17 over 17. So what's important is that whatever happens to our standards happens to our samples. Sound familiar? I'm sure you guys have heard that. Whatever you do to your standards, you do to your samples. Whatever happens with our standards happens with our samples. And what we can see is that even though the intensities and the overall ratios change, if they change proportionately for our samples, we're in good shape. And so this is an example of one that happened. So this is BHVO over LSFAP. And we could see these are different acquisitions over time. And yeah, drift happened, but everything tracks. So our seven over six for BHVO divided by our seven over six for LSVAC remains reasonably, con yeah, reasonably constant. So there is a little bit of variation here and we have a point that's, eh, you know, those things happen, but for the most part, you can see these two track each other the entire time. So our ratio and our del value is conserved, even when intensity drops or things change over time. So this is what it looks like over time. So we, we're we looking at BHVO, BIR, and AGV. These are our United States geologic standards. These are rock materials, basalts, two basalts, and this andesite. And what we see is that when we're looking back in um, November or, uh, of 2020, and then we had a small COVID hiatus, which we shall not mention, and then we pick it up in, in uh, 2021 and look beyond, we have really good stability over time. Yeah, we got an outlier over there. And if we can see this kind of ramps up to our outlier. I think this is a column thing. I think our column got dirty and wasn't efficiently separating lithium and was separating lithium seven and six differently. So I think this is probably a column issue. But nonetheless, it might also be a we don't know what the heck it is issue. So if you notice 3.7 to 5.7, these are our recommended values. It's 4.5 plus or minus 0.4. Uh, 
but this falls within the 5.7 within error. So hmm, maybe, but most of the time it's falling squarely within our, our the, the recommended brackets. Also, if we notice that the two sigma variability, including this outlier is less than two per mil over the course of nearly a year. Are we nearly a year? Oh, no, we're more than a year, sorry. So it's a year and a half, almost a year and a half. If we delete this outlier, we're under that one per mil, and that's where we wanna be. BIR, again, 3.9, the, the shaded box here is our recommended values, but we can go as low as 3.3 uh, off of a whopping five analyses, but nonetheless, we're looking at somewhere just over three with a long-term stability of 0 0.57 per mil. We're way under our one per mil. The andesite from Guano Valley, it is dead on. We are right where we should be in all of these analyses and we're getting long-term precisions of 0.34 per mil. So our quad is doing every bit as good as a multi-collector in this respect. And we're doing it with low amounts of lithium. Although if you notice Guano Valley has more lithium, BIR has very, very little and BHVO is kind of mid-range for, for igneous rocks. But we're doing it on very low amounts of lithium in a quad very quickly. And we are stable, really stable, both in the short term in the long term. And that is key here. <clears throat> so I'm almost done. I'm gonna, gonna give you a, a couple of examples, uh, real-time examples. So this is the work that uh, my colleague Alex uh, and his advisor, Jeff Ryan, are doing on uh, some samples that they drilled out of the seafloor uh, south of Japan. This is on the Izubonin Arc. And what they're trying to understand is how does, and if, I don't know how many of you know about plate tectonics. I saw a few geologists in there. Hopefully you've all taken a geology course somewhere, but plate tectonics basically says that one plate sinks under the other and the plates are destroyed at that point. And as a result, things get recycled under there and you get volcanoes that pop up. The Izumbonan Arc is a line of volcanoes south of Japan. Uh, in fact, Japan is a volcanic arc as well, but they're trying to understand how did that system get started? And one of the things that they wanna look at obviously is lithium isotopes, because you can tell the difference between mantle, between uh, seawater, between um, a whole bunch of other things, uh, sediments and continental crust that could get all mixed up as the plate goes down and get into our magma. So we were able to see things. But these samples come from the sea floor. And as a result, they are typically altered by seawater. So, you know, when a volcano erupts on the ocean floor, you're dealing with thousand degree magma that comes out against seawater that's at what, two degrees C. And so that's that's a shock to the system for both the seawater and the magma. And interactions, chemical interactions, of course, occur. And then as it sits there on the seafloor, more chemical interactions can occur and we can get alteration. And so when we look at the unaltered samples, we see that we really have, other than our errors, very little variation in terms of, or, or, or rather, shall I say, no systematic variation in terms of our, uh, um, our um, lithium isotopic ratio. When we consider mildly altered samples, we can see that we have some variation. And we have highly altered samples, we can see that we have a high degree of variation. So what is this variation that I'm talking about? It's leaching. So what we did was we tried to chemically remove that alteration. And try as we may, try as we might, over the course of six hours worth of soaking in a low molarity acid to get rid of the alteration, we find really no systematic difference. Whereas with this one, after the first hour, we leached out. And then after that, there's really no systematic difference. 
Whereas with the highly altered samples after that first hour, we leached out uh, a whole bunch of the alteration and we see that our values are lower. But in this case, what we're seeing is this high six per mil versus much lower, close to three per mil. And this is uh, for three different samples. <clears throat> Excuse me. So sometimes you have altered samples and this one per mil variation, this one per mil, uh, uh, sorry, precision is what we need. If we had a three per mil precision, we couldn't really tell the difference between the altered and the unaltered. If we have a one per mil precision, we can. And so we can start to see, at least for you folks in industry, if lithium makes a difference and you're trying to do something chemically to it, you need that one per mil precision or better long-term to be able to see any sort of chemical treatments and what you might've done to it that makes your analysis better. Same idea here. Uh, effects of leaching on volcanic glasses. We see no alteration, no big difference, mild alteration. We could see that first hour and then significant alteration. And we see that we can really tell the difference. So these are a couple of different uh, uh, bonanites and fabs. Uh, if you guys wanna know what those are, I'll be glad to tell you afterwards. So here we go for the 2000p and hopefully whatever instrument you have if you don't have a 2000p um, we collected data for uh, approximately 173 seconds so close to three minutes which is pretty good but we could probably reduce that to less than two minutes per sample but it might be the expense of the read delay or the sample flush times but still three to five minutes a sample is not horrible two to three minutes of sample, I mean, that's, that's pretty good to get really good solid data. So the other thing is that you wanna set up the timing similar to a laser ablation ICPMS. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever used that, but it's basically a time intensity data, but we want those dwell times to be really short. We wanna capture each and every data point and we wanna work with those. Um, the The, softwares can be funky. So I prefer to take this data, capture every single data point with these quick dial times. So we're looking at 75 sweeps per reading, 150 replicates, we might be able to shorten that really quick, back and forth, back and forth, tricking into being a, a multi-collector type and then read each and every sample. We wanna adjust our sample and flush and read delays to be long enough to eliminate that ingrowth should we have it. And we did see it in some places and not in others. <clears throat> we wanna set our wash time to 90 seconds, but you know, feel free to man mon manually monitor it. Woo, say that six times fast. So basically we wanna make sure that the lithium gets out and lithium is pretty mobile, so if you, if you rinse with a 2% nitric, it should come out of the lines quite easily. And then we did not use any calibrators or internal standards. Uh, some of these uh, um, uh, earlier studies did use internal standards. Um, our thought was it was just one more thing to measure, one more mass to go to. And so going back and forth would be now through three masses and we wanted to try and eliminate any potential interference from the electronics as it switched back and forth. Big question, can I use my auto sampler, or my AS93, my FAST, prep FAST, whatever auto sampler is the latest and greatest. These are the three that I have in my lab. And the answer is yeah, maybe. Um, we have a graduate student who's been collecting these and, and, and Alex has sat with them as they've gone and literally manually moved the probe into each and every sample and each and every rinse because the the issue is the tubing. And the way our lab is set up, we couldn't make the tubing really short. And so the tubing was quite long and we were worried about that seven, six fractionation. You gotta weigh the time saving advantages of using the auto sampler between the effects of fractionation and having that more sample tubing and having that automation. Uh, it's not something we did. It's not something I even wanted to try given the way our setup is, 
but please, by all means, in your lab, go try it. Let me know. I'd love to hear what your results are. I would not use the auto diluter if you have one. I would make sure that you make all your sample solutions and samples up by hand, um, at least initially. If one wants to go out and try and use vacuum sample injection and different sample loops, I encourage you to go do that. Please do, and 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 let me know how that works. Um, so so I'm going to open up one more poll because I'm sure most of you guys are sleeping uh, just before I get to my final conclusions. And and the, the question is, do you think you're going to use isotope or you're going to do any isotope kind of stuff in your lab anytime soon? And hopefully this this stuff kind of helps. So. If you're if you're still awake, please answer the poll. It's open, um, but I want to know, you know, given what I said and, and and the fact that you know, the column and doing the separation is probably the hardest part. The instrument itself probably does it pretty easily. Yep, everybody's tuned out. Oh yes, oh there we go. People woke up. Yay. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we're about a third of you say you're probably going to do it, and poll's still going. I'll leave it open for, for a little bit. But you know that that's that's pretty good. Thirty to forty percent of you think you they might do it, and it's it's really as as with everything else ICP, it really is. Oh, now we're getting closer to a fifty fifty split. Some of you guys are coming over to the dark side. I like this. Um, Really, the, the most important thing here, as with everything ICPMS, is prep. And I really, really do think it's prep. I think that the ICPs and, and the, the, um, the, the, uh, the latest versions of quad ICPs are certainly sensitive enough and certainly fast enough that they can handle isotope ratios. Um, one more thing I will say about isotope ratios is what kind of precision do you need? And so there are three different types of isotope ratios that we look at, radiogenic isotopic ratios. Um, in the geologic world, strontium is really, really important. And we need five decimal place precision to really be able to tell differences between certain rocks. We're never gonna get that on a quad. It's just not happening. There's stable isotopic, traditional stable isotopes. So stable isotopes of oxygen, hydrogen, uh, 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 nitrogen. Those stable isotopes are generally done on a on a on a um, isotope ratio mass spec. And all you guys know, we don't measure oxygen, we don't measure nitrogen, we don't measure carbon, and for good reason. Um, if we were try to do that on our quad, we're going to be swamped by atmospheric sicker. So those are out. So what we're talking about here measuring is really all about, oops, all about non-traditional stable isotopes. And the non-traditional stable isotopes, there's lithium, magnesium. Oh, poll closed, thank you. There's lithium, magnesium, there's iron, there's a whole bunch of things I've seen them done in seawaters, freshwaters, wastewaters, rocks, meteorites. Uh, there are tons of applications to that. Lithium, obviously, because of what we use it for, has its own applications. But I do believe, and, and one of the things that we're going to try pretty soon, is um, other stable isotope, non-traditional stable isotope systems and we really want to, you know, try and explore what what can our quad ICPs do. So with that, I'm going to say um, I really like to hear your thoughts. I'd like to hear about your applications. I know I went a little over. I appreciate you sticking with me through this. And uh, yeah, that I'm at that I'm done. If you have any any questions, um, these are some of the references. If you want them, just just shoot me a line. So I'm going to open it up right there. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Zach. That, that was a really good uh, presentation. I actually learned a bit in there. So it's uh, time to go to some questions here. Just a reminder, everyone, uh, feel free to um, put your questions 
in the question pane, I'm just going to Just here, either in the in the web. Yeah, I just took over. There. I just said I can switch back and forth if we need to, to reference anything. So, just a reminder, everyone, put the questions in the questions pane, either in the web or desktop interface. Um, I I had a quick question here, Zach. You know, with that fractionation you're seeing, have you looked at different tubing and and the effects of different tubing and, and what that's one thing we hadn't tried i mean I, I i thought about that we try and use the the pfte but definitely the pump tubing mm -hmm. is, is the it's it's the the poly whatever it is poly yeah poly the tygon stuff yeah, right tygon. yeah and so definitely um if we had a, a a slicker tubing like a you know a teflon type tubing or a teflon line tubing that might actually be better. We might, we, one of the things that I want to try, but we just haven't had chance to yet is self aspirating. Well, well you um, have the, the, the 2000 P so that has the built in flow injection valve. Yep. Um, have, have you tried that? Cause that, that in theory should be a little bit better. You know, you won't have as, as much uh, time to get the sample in. Yeah, and no, I, I, agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think that the 2000P has has a lot of features and and there's a, there's a lot of stuff you could do with it and it's yeah. just you know with 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 covid and everything and timing and and trying to get the data <laughs> out for for Alex to actually get graduated uh we uh, there's there's a lot more that we want to try and gotcha. like I said I, I encourage the audience to go out and try it let me know what you find out um this is this is still very much so a work in progress yeah you said you just kind of started this during COVID, right yeah we started during COVID. it was alex and i in the lab and you know the multi-collectors he was like oh i can't get on the multi i can't get on the multi-collector and i'm tuning up the <laughs> instrument and i'm seeing six and seven every time i do a mass call and i'm like god we could get it here uh, yeah yeah and and, so, and and i i've done some of this work year, years back uh, on on these lithium and yeah as you said some of the previous studies showed very very long dwell times and and to your point at least on the next year, uh i found i didn't need to have these long dwell times and actually i found by hopping i would get better you know yep. uh, ratio precision right yeah um, I, I think that's exactly right is that's exactly what we're seeing at least on the next year is that hopping back and forth really fast we're, we're getting better precisions or or at least the same uh the yeah. same or better than, yeah than if we were to sit there and look longer yeah and that's what i was finding as well another thing when i was doing some isotope ratio work again it's been a few years um i was using inclusional dampening in, in the cell too to take out some some to help normalize the ion beam as it's coming through the cell. Um, so that sometimes hurts. The problem with lithium being a, a low mass, though, so, uh, you'll probably lose a lot of sensitivity doing that. So, yeah, um, and that, that's something we definitely wanted to avoid because it was it was really also about how low can we go. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and we we do have some data from a multi collector from a colleague of mine, mm -hmm. uh, and he was just. You know, we sent him the cuts that we had for for the next scene, and he's like, I can't see anything. And so oh, it was really he, he got, got literally pretty much so no signal. It wasn't enough that the, the the standard deviations were through the roof because he really was seeing blank no, levels. No, we're yeah. your signals. <laughs> yeah. And that yeah, that was that was really what we wanted to do initially. Um, and that's what a lot of this work was based on is how low can you go and how fast can we get there? Mm -hmm. All right, so I, a couple questions here. Um, so first one, thanks, Zach. This is an excellent presentation and very helpful. So two quick questions, it's two part. <laughs> um, can a Nexian 300 do this work? And then the second part is, is a clean lab necessary for lithium isotope sample preparation? So to answer that question on the Nexian 300, do a mass cal using lithium and see if you can see six and seven. If you can at one PPB, then the answer is yes. Yeah, I suspect uh, they would. Yeah. Yeah. If you can't see it, then the answer is no. So when I tried to do this on the old Elan, 
I really couldn't see six. I could see seven, but I really couldn't see six. It was it was just the sensitivities were too low. The the advantage well, of the next yeah, low mass sensitivity was much lower on the land design optics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so the other advantage of of the Nexian, at least you know, with the Nexian P, is the quadrifold the, the ion deflector. So yeah, that that exactly. QID means that all your ions are going through. I mean, so that your your sensitivity, my sensitivity over the Elan, and I can't speak about the 300s because I haven't really used them. Aaron, you might be able to yep. answer that better than I. But you know, with the with the from the Elan to the to the Nexian was about a five to ten time increase in sensitivity. On yeah, the on the three hundreds, actually, we were seeing that on the Elan to the Nexian three hundred when we went to the quadrupline deflector design. Um, low mass was the biggest change, right? Because as you said, with the quadrupline deflector, uh, we lose we lose less of the low mass ions due to you know space charge effects primarily, yeah. right? And and get, going around the photon stop that was in the land. Yeah. Um, that photon so, stop really, really does its job because there's a well, lot it, of things that get knocked out. It does. It, it, I mean, it's a very simple design. Did its job stop photons, but it what also by having to go around it, it's it's harder to control the lower mass, the lighter mass. They start sure. flying; those ions start flying away, and you lose them. Um, whereas in the quadrupline deflector and triple cone, it, we can we can keep that beam tighter, and and the low it really shows like. In lithium yeah. and brilliant. It, yeah, it's it's literally five to ten times sensitive. It's it's amazing. So yeah. to answer that Second. question, if you do your tuning on it and you could see both masses, then yeah, you could probably do this work. Um, is a clean lab necessary? The answer is for, clean for lithium. Yes, clean clean. No, um, our lab actually we have we maintain what's called a boron and lithium free lab i call it my class 1 million clean room because you know we we have we have uh, uh, filters in the ac vents and we have a double room chamber but other than that we just wipe it down and make sure that we're clean for those two elements so a full on clean room no uh but you do want to keep your room clean for lithium and the reason i'm saying that is because with rock digestions we do something called a lithium metaborate flux fusion where we're literally mixing the rocks with lithium metaborate cooking it at high temperature and turning it into a magma and then dumping it into a bucket of acid uh to digest it so if you're doing lithium work and and, and literally high really high percentages of lithium lithium is going to get all over the place yes it will contaminate your sample so you really want to keep the room as clean for lithium as possible, but a full on, you know, class 100 clean room. No, you don't need that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, another, another question. The next question is why would, do we need to do lithium separation? Can we just measure it directly? Yeah, well, actually you can. The issue is really the other alkalis in there. So, um, way back when, uh, can I get to a slide? Am, am I, oh, yeah, I, can, I can make you a presenter. No, I can make you the presenter again here. Uh, it's not it's not that important, but but uh, the bottom go. line, there we go. Screen two. There we go. So the bottom line is is if you read this ninety six paper and also uh, Jeff Cote et al. Uh, two thousand four, what they were finding was that matrix, and it's really matrix, 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 matrix. And so people have been separating out the lithium in order to avoid that matrix and especially issues with sodium. So I definitely go check out those papers. Um, they explain it far better than I can, but essentially, I mean, you know, if you've done ICP work, you understand how important matrix matching is. And, you know, you, you look at your internal standards bouncing all over the place, depending on what's in your sample. And that's the real issue here is that we want to kill off the matrix. And again, you know, what people did instead of to try and deal with the matrix is they lowered down their, their, um, their RF. And so they were trying to kill the matrix by using a lower RF so that they weren't ionizing 
uh, anything but the easily ionized. Unfortunately, sodium is also easily ionized. <laughs> So um, part of the part of the issue is that if you have a high sodium sample, you know that that just it it sticks to things, it slows down the lithium, it's it it just it it becomes a mess. So ideally, yeah, separation seems to be the way to go. I've not tried this without separating. I could, um, but if you do, let me know. Let me know. I think it's I think it's all going to make. It's going to affect your precision, though. I think pretty. Yeah, pretty the, well, the, the ionization profile in the plasma will be changed based on the sample, right? So all your different reference materials and what you were calibrating against yeah. is, you know, they Correct. they have different levels of sodium, right? Absolutely, and I think that, yeah. and and it's not just the sodium, but sodium's the well, big one. Other stuff too, but yeah, yeah, the sodium's probably the big, yeah. Sodium's so the, the big one. So separation basically is getting you getting you away from a bunch of stuff, but primarily the, the sodium. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, a next question, sir. Uh, um, I know we're trying to be conscious of people's time here. Um, will most of this apply when there are multiple isotopes, more than two? We're going to find out. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's kind of where we're going next. Um, we want to hit some of the other tra uh, non-traditional stable isotope systems where there are multiple isotopes. And that's exactly what we want to find out. Uh, lithium, lithium was kind of the low-hanging fruit. And it was something that we were very interested in because we were going to do it anyway. Um, and there were it's easily ionized. There's two elements. Yeah. There's no, no interferences. So it really was the low-hanging fruit. I I don't know. I can't answer yeah. that until I try, and we will be trying. So, yeah, uh, uh, and from my from my experience, different ice, you know, they have their own issues. Lithium, the as you said, no interferences like polyatomic, but there's ionization effects, right? Oh yeah. Uh, and so, so yeah, different elements will have different, you know, issues. Maybe polyatomic overlaps or whatever based on yep. based on the matrix. Yeah. And and then there's the chemistry of the other systems that have yeah. multiple isotopes too so just just getting them separated getting them clean different oxidation states oh there's the speciation and fractionation Woo! yeah but mm. we're we're we, we're intent to try some of that stuff so the answer is i'll let you know as soon as i know <laughs> if, if yeah. it works at all so yeah, yeah no that'd be that'd be great um uh, next uh, question. Really enjoyed the presentation. Have you tried shorter dwell times? Uh, I was using two millisecond and one millisecond for copper and lead ratios. Have you tried uh, self aspiration rather than peristaltic pump to improve precision? So there's two two yeah. questions really there. Yeah, and the self aspiration is is exactly where we were going next. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, Obviously, things have been a little slow, and I can't I can't have the machine just running lithium 24/7. There's there's other stuff that our lab has to do, but yeah, no, I agree. I think self aspiration, especially through Teflon tubing, is probably a better way to go mm -hmm. um, to improve precision. No, I have not tried going for even shorter dwell times. Um, I just wanted to make sure I got data, and and we were getting getting it. So something we could definitely try if you were getting really good uh ratios and good precision for copper at two and one um i'd love to hear about it you know please please by all means you know email me um let me know you know what you did and what what kind of precisions you were getting because it's it's definitely again work in progress yeah yeah um yeah reach out to zach uh there i believe uh, it's nick asking that question so uh, if, uh, if you need this contact information, let me know. And then the last uh, question that I see here is, uh, please suggest alternative lithium-7 reference materials besides LSVEC or LSVEC, 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 yeah. Uh, so there is, can you all still see my screen over here? I can, yeah, we can see it. Really, I mean, a little small little text yeah, there but yeah. <laughs> there we go so i'm trying to make it bigger over here oh come on get over there there you go so yeah. there's this irmm-16 that's the only other one that i know of 
hmm. that has been characterized, and it's the it's it's the new one for Elsfeck. Elsfeck doesn't it's it's done. It's finished. I think you know ours may be one of the last bottles around, uh, but this is the IRMM-16, and I looked look through IAEA, the International Atomic uh, Energy Association, they, they have some standards or the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So uh, uh, NIST might have it, they, they, or IAEA might have it, but that's, that's the one that took over. Uh, so that's the new one that, that replaces ELSFAC. Okay. Oh, Other questions? Um, I do not see any more questions at this time. All right. Yeah, no, that was really good. Well, I appreciate everybody joining me and thank you for your attention. I, I really, you know, it's been it's been fun. Again, work in progress. Um, if you all come up with something or hear things, I'd love to hear about them. Uh, science is a collaborative process, we hope. So, yeah. you know, by all means, uh, I, I think you know where to find me or I hope you know where to find me. My email is somewhere. I take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I put the email earlier. Um, and uh, if you want to reach out to myself, if you didn't get it, um, I will. Uh, I'll provide you Zach's email. Um, you can ch you can Google him as well. I'm sure University of South Florida. Um, yep. Zach Atlas, Zachary right? Atlas. I, 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 Zachary I, I, Atlas. That you'll turn up, right? <laughs> there, there's one other guy, and I'm not him. <laughs> Otherwise, I have the first nine up there or something. I don't know how I did that. But, but probably the only one in University of South Florida <laughs> doing, doing ge geology and geochemistry. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only Zachary Atlas who's geology. So, yeah, you put in Zachary Atlas in geology, I'm pretty sure you'll find me. Yeah. <laughs> and I will have uh, this uploaded uh, for all on demand at, at this uh, URL. So with all the other webinars, uh, feel free to go to this and you'll get it you'll get uh an email in about 24 hours um with a link to the recording as well um so on behalf of uh perkin elmer thank you for joining and thank you zach for uh, presenting today it was a great presentation and uh thank everyone for attending and sticking in to a few minutes past the the hour now so um Feel free to reach out to myself at any time. Uh, again, you'll have my email in, in one of our communications. And once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey in the presentation. We'd appreciate it if you could complete that, provide your feedback. Um, and as I said, you'll get a, an email in the next 24 hours with a link to the recording. So on uh, behalf of uh, Perkinomer again and our presenter, thanks for joining. Have a great rest Thank of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye.